and welcome to another episode of Just Curious Relationships. As always, I'm your host, Megan Holmgren, and today I'm joined by our favorite licensed marriage and family therapist, Margaret Doherty, as well as the incomparable Dr. Stephanie McNally, an OBGYN and director of OBGYN services at Northwell Health's Katz Institute for Women's Health. So, ladies, hello. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Thank you for being here today. We are pumped. Yes, yeah. very excited. Um, so... Margaret, I know you're familiar with the deal here, uh, but Dr. McNally, um, again, thank you for coming. So what we do is read Reddit posts that I have scoured the corners of the internet and Reddit for uh, and get your reaction to them. And per the usual, I have slid over <laughs> face down copies and you guys can turn your copies over now and I'm, I'll read the prompt and then we'll, we'll see what you guys think. Okay. My 32 male girlfriend, 35 female, has just been told she's going through menopause and can't have children. How can I best support her in the next few days? My girlfriend of three years has been seeing a doctor over the last few months as she hadn't had her period. She went to see some specialists for tests and last week she was informed she may be menopausal or as it's below 40, year old, 40 years old, premature ovarian failure. She got her test results back today and the worst is confirmed. She has slim to no chance of having children. When this was a possibility last week, I told her that I'd support her no matter what, and this is a blow, but we have other options for children if the news was bad. We had talked about adopting and other options before. We both wanted to have biological children, but even before this, we were open to the idea of adopting, fostering, and other parenting options, so it wasn't like I just went, oh shit, adoption it is. She got the news earlier and I'm home from work now. I told her that the weekend is absolutely hers and I'd be here to support and help her as she needs. She just needs to let me know. We had a brief chat and hug before and I just reminded her that this doesn't change anything for me uh, and that we, her especially, just need to take time and think. But regardless of the situation, I love her and I'm here for her. She said she just needed some space and time alone and I understand that. Sorry for the messy post. I guess I'm just asking here for advice from anyone who has went through a similar situation both as the partner or as a woman, as to how I can best uh, be here for her in the next few days. I know we're fine long term. I just don't want her to think she's alone while also avoiding jumping to the opposite and smothering her. Any advice would be really helpful. TLDR, girlfriend of three years, unexpectedly can't have children, looking for the best way to support her while the news is fresh. Wow. That's a lot. That's a tough <laughs> one. She's young. Yeah. Um, so I do want to get your opinions, but I, my, my first reaction, especially as someone who's, um, rapidly approaching 35, I was like, that can happen. That's terrifying. I also had that thought. Um, so yeah, I guess from a relationship perspective and then from a medical perspective too, what's your reactions to this and what would you say to him or to her or to both of them? This is a lot of grief. Right. There's so much loss here of more than just um, we can't have a baby. It's a loss of what we thought our future was going to look like. It's a loss of what a parent is going to look like. And I love that he's like, the weekend's yours. She's going to need more than a weekend. Mm -hmm. Right. Like she's probably in shock. Even if you knew these were one of the options that might happen, nothing like actually hearing from a doctor, you cannot have children. Yeah. Um, and he's going to have to grieve. And it's he he also doesn't fully understand what it's like to be told you can't. He's not the one with the quote-unquote problem. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be tough for the two of them to kind of navigate this and, like, learn to communicate about it and talk about it. But I just, like, grief is the word that's, like, screaming at me over, like, the ability to have kids. Yeah. It was the plans changed. The plans were ruined. My life is over. Right? That type yeah. of feeling. And... From a clinical perspective, things that we really should be looking for every time a woman comes into the office, we ask, when was the first day of your last period? Mm -hmm. A pretty common question. Yeah. And then on top of that, how often do they come? How often do they last? Mm -hmm. Because there are, for people that do have premature ovarian failure or premature menopause, even early menopause. So menopause, and when you look at some of the studies, it's a swan study. Mm -hmm looking at different ethnic backgrounds, different genetic components, different surgical options, all of those things vary for when a woman goes through menopause. Mm -hmm. And that by definition for a woman that has a uterus, we can talk more about that, 
But for that, it's one full year without a period. So if there are warning signs or Mm -hmm. triggering things prior, that's where you need to really start to talk to your doctor or your provider about it. Hey, I haven't had a period in four months. What do you think? Yeah. And again, you have that early or that premature ovarian failure. Between 40 and 44, it's still early menopause. Yeah. And after 45, all bets are off. I want to pick up on, I, because I think, you know, obviously doing prep for these, I looked into things like early and premature menopause and um, kind of more in the how to be a sympathetic and compassionate partner. But it it actually never occurred to me that this is grief, like for both of them. Yeah. So I guess then, you know, obviously it's going to take more than a weekend, like, what I mean, it's gonna be different for every person, but how long can this take? That is gonna vary. I think he's also jumping to we can adapt, we can do this, we have a plan, it's fine. Yeah, that's off the table right now. Like, not to talk about what you're gonna do to have a baby. Yeah, it's great that you have options. That takes a lot to do, right? Adoption's not easy. You just don't go to an agency and say, I want to adopt a child, and they go, Okay, give us a few to find one that needs a home, and then you can come back and we'll give yeah. you the child. Like, this is going to be an ongoing process. And I think he's very in fixed mode. What can I do to make her comfortable? Mm -hmm. And he has no idea what to do, right? And she probably can't even process alone. I think she should go probably to individual therapy first. Yeah. And figure out what's going on for her and how to learn to communicate it. Yeah. And then if that doesn't work on their own, then couples therapy. Yeah. Yeah. And he may need his own individual, right? Because there may be things he feels that he feels he can't tell her right now because she's in so much pain. He might not feel entitled to his feelings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Something you said, though, that I thought was interesting is bringing it up to the doctor, right? Four months. And the anxiety people have, unfortunately, about talking to doctors about these things. Yeah. How can, like, if I have clients that are struggling with medical female issues... What's the best way for them to go about talking to their doctor about this? And is it finding the right doctor, right? Because I'm like, you don't like me as a therapist. We don't jive. That's okay. There's a better fit. And that's where, again, you said it yourself. Each person's process is different. Mm -hmm. So I think as somebody that really wants to pull the information from patients herself, I'm going to ask you those questions. But if somebody is not, it may not be the right fit. Or I encourage patients, write your checklist of when you come in. Mm. So we live in a digital age, or even if it's an old-fashioned pen and paper, yep. I'm concerned about this. Put it on your hand. Put it in your phone. So that way you have that little trigger to remember, wow, that was a problem that I was thinking about. One more thing I'd like to bring up, and part of that is also how we communicate. And I know that we at Northwell have an amazing new CMO, Dr. Jill Kalman. Mm-hmm. And a big push from her, and it's so important, is relationship-centered communication, Mm -hmm. where physicians and providers need to change their mindsets, not about the, oh, tell me this, how about open-ended? And I think also that if we can start to engage in that open-ended dialogue, that patient with her checklist may start to be able to be empowered. Right. Absolutely. That makes sense. And I think even going back to them, open-ended questions, right? If the husband Mm -hmm. has questions, not just are you okay? Because that's an easy yes or no. What are you feeling? What is going on in your head? What thoughts are you having? Yeah. How do you think this is moving forward? And exactly to Margaret's point that he's seeing things from such a different perspective Mm -hmm. that she already has jumped 17 steps ahead and hasn't even given herself the opportunity to get to where he is or where she's at. It takes a lot of time sometimes. Yeah. And it's very easy to talk about other options. I mean, I talk with my fiance all the time. By the time we're married, I'll be 35. I'm like, what if I can't have kids? What if it's harder? I'm Mm -hmm. older. And we talk about adoption and all that. It's great in theory. But then when that actually is your option, it's it's a lot different to stare different ball game. Yeah. Because especially with um, something like a premature menopause, options like fertility treatments aren't necessarily going to be there for her, right? Unless they're exploring something like maybe an egg donor or would that even not be a viable option then? No, that's actually right on point. So just to kind of give some of the biology, Mm -hmm. 
biologic women, 46XX, are born with a finite amount of eggs. Mm -hmm. And we actually start to lose some of our eggs even before we're born. So I don't know what Mother Nature is doing to us. <laughs> we'll have to have a talk someday in the future. <laughs> so even by the time you start going through ovulatory cycles, when you get your first period, our eggs are starting to, to die naturally. That's just part of the process. And so for a woman that does have that early menopause, mm -hmm. the eggs are probably not there because her time frame of that egg um, it's called apoptosis, where the eggs are just naturally dying. It's a biologic process. Yeah. It's just more accelerated. Yeah. Now, there are certain genetic things that can happen in a female body that have already predisposed them to not have enough eggs if they want to have a child. But to that point, her anatomy is still most likely normal, yeah. where egg donation is a possibility. So yeah. for her, the biologic point but one of the things I always say to patients and kind of pulling in, and I love that we have such a diverse table here because you have the mind-body connection because you can't exist without it, is yeah. that when I talk to my patients, do you want to reproduce or do you want to be a parent? Yeah. Mm, I love that. I actually really love that question too. And that was a yes, no question. I'm aware of that. <laughs> but it's so but powerful that, because it's so, it's two different things. And it, I mean, it can lead to op more open ended questions about what their motivations are between behind whatever answer that might that might be. But yeah, that's that is it's a, an it, it is an interesting question to pose to someone who's maybe staring down the barrel of not an easy road to becoming a parent. So, do you want to reproduce or do you want to be a parent? And there's sometimes kind of that perspective going into it where it's different. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's different. It's not what you had in your playbook, but it doesn't mean that it can't be as good or if not better. And also you look at couples that do have the same biology. Mm -hmm. um, so same gender couples have a different process, a different yeah. road. Absolutely. Female egg donation, sperm donation, all of these things. Thankfully, we live in a, a state that supports this. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, it, I mean, I, I feel... I feel very deeply for this this gentleman that it must be hard for him again for the support, but for her, like you said, it's 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 grief. Yeah, it's the mourning of what should have been in right. her mind. Yeah, right. And the plan of what our family is going to look like and how this is going to go. And I'm going to have the baby shower and I'm going to have a birthing plan. Yeah, and we're going to bring the baby home from the hospital or people are going to come. Like all these things that you usually see other people going through, and you're like, that's just how it's going to be. That's the way it's supposed to be. And then that's ripped from you. Yeah. I think it's interesting because, I mean, um, we we covered, you know, infertility and fertility treatments pretty extensively at the well. It's something that unfortunately is a part of, you know, my family and friend circles and things that I've had to become way more immersed in than I ever thought I would have as, you know, maybe a 20 something. Um, and I think for a lot of people that go through fertility treatments that aren't facing, a, you know, an earlier premature menopause diagnosis, there's already that sense of loss of like, well, I don't get to just do this naturally. I feel like this would have to kind of just pile on to that because it's it's so many different levels of grief, of loss, of of the way things should be and now they can't be. Um, so I, I also, when I read this this prompt, I was like, I know this is the one I have to go with because I, I just immediately could feel how desperate he was and how much I appreciated a partner like that existing for her because he wants to be so supportive and um, maybe she won't want that <laughs> necessarily and right at first. he's going to have to get comfortable yeah. that he might not know what to do. Yeah. And that's going to be really uncomfortable at first because he's yeah. watching his partner in so much pain. He can't process his own pain. Yeah. It's going to be like months, maybe a year or two, if we can put a time on it of like, when this is going to feel good. Yeah. Or when it's at least going to feel accepted. Yeah. Maybe not even good. Right. Um, so to sort of transition, because we've we've touched pretty, I think, thoroughly on how they might be feeling and the hypotheticals of children and what those roads might look like and the kind of emotions behind them. But in a very physical sense, she's going to be going through some stuff, I would imagine, in the immediate term. So what do the symptoms of premature or early menopause look like? Do they differ from regular menopause? Are they, you know, more intense because of your, you know, younger age or, or what? That 
such a good way to look at it. If I'm younger, will they be easier? The answer is, is we don't know Mm -hmm. because somebody who is in her 50s versus somebody who's in their 30s are experiencing the same hormonal change. So somebody may have little to no symptoms and other people, it may be affecting their quality of daily life. So for those women, when they're identified, and a lot of that has to do with symptomatic changes, hormone level changes, you really want to focus on their long-term health because, again, the average age of menopause, depending on your background, is anyway from 49 to 51. Mm -hmm. So this woman still has 15 plus years of need for her body. We're talking about mind. Mm -hmm. We're talking about cardiovascular benefits bone health, estrogen protects our bodies in a very significant way. So if she's having that deprivation, that loss for 15 additional years, these are women that really benefit benefit from HT, hormone therapy. Mm -hmm. That's a conversation to have with their provider, their physician, but really these women's symptoms are very similar Mm -hmm. in terms of what could happen at the average age. So really need to be treated the same. And I think When you look at just menopause in general, you have that mind. It's sleep changes. It's hot flashes. So those hot flashes that people have are all starting in the brain. And the estrogen that your body wants is down. It's affecting your uh, breast tissue. That's changing. It's affecting your peripheral fat. Sometimes you get more belly fat. Mm -hmm. It's affecting your whole pelvic floor. And I like the front to back campaign, bladder, vaginal area, and rectum. They all change. Yeah. So for those women, that whole head to body really needs to be assessed and treated. I can like almost imagine what she's going through <laughs> on top of that. And then there's all of that right. of what her body is now going to do and how that's going to impact her long term. Right. Reproducing or not. And that is so important to identify because those symptomatic pieces can be alleviated, can be tailored to her. Mm-hmm. But a lot of it, and there's a very significant association in the literature, and I'm sure you can attest to this, women that have vasomotor symptoms, those hot flashes, actually have higher depressive symptoms hmm. and higher problems with sleep. Why? They're being woken up in the middle of the night drenched. Right. Yeah. So that affects their quality of life. So all of these pieces are so interconnected. And I think in, in people that have heard me talk about menopause and this whole perimenopausal period— Women are spending a majority of their life in perimenopause before that happens. Yeah. And then menopause, that's your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, your 70s, your 80s, which is our average life expectancy in the U.S. Yeah. So now this woman has a whole other decade. Yeah. So all of those things, we can help her with that symptomatic. And then that's where kind of you come in, Margaret, to help her (laughs) with all the other pieces that are the harder pieces to fix and treat. And I can imagine even her sex drive may change and Mm -hmm. that can impact the intimacy of the relationship and her not understanding what's going on with her body and none of her friends going through it, right? She'll have to talk to her mom, aunts, other people older and kind of be like, how am I in this space, right? There could be a lot of anger too that this is kind of what happened to her. And to that point, to piggyback on it, the family history is important Because there are genetic component to this, that if there's a family history, a good clinician is going to pick that up. Wait, how old was your mom when she went through it? Oh, you don't know your mom. What about your closest relative? And if somebody tells me 40, my warning bells are going off in their Mm -hmm. 20s. Have you had treatment for certain types of cancers, chemotherapy agents that can affect fertility? And Megan, like you talked about a lot about fertility, All of these medications about egg harvesting pre-treatment is Mm -hmm. also something that's completely on the table. Yeah. I've had the privilege of working with our fertility team for people that needed to get that done quickly and get those eggs harvested. So again, if somebody went through the treatment many years ago, their egg function may not have been taken into consideration. And now we're really looking at women's health in a much more holistic way. Yeah. And I can imagine for her, she feels less of a woman, right? Because- society and media and everything we've grown up learning, at least in like the 80s, the 90s, like stuff like that is your kind of purpose is to reproduce and to have children. It's not like that anymore, right? There's a lot of people that just like choose not to have kids, right? And they're, that's okay now. That's acceptable now. Yeah. And for her, she may have stories in her head of like, but this is what I was meant to do. Yeah. And now I can't. Am I a quote unquote good female? Yeah. 
And I, I wonder, because I know in here it says um, that they were open to other ideas of becoming parents, um, whether it was adopting or fostering or, or something else. Um, but I wonder if that's something that could change, you know, having the confirmation of you can't have your own biological children, or at least, you know, maybe, maybe then it is a conversation of, okay, my, my ovarian reserves are low, but how low can we do a quick harvest of mm -hmm. like whatever eggs I might have and see if they're of good quality. But if she, if the answer still is no, and truly you cannot have your own biological child, could that change her perspective on wanting to be a parent at all? And, and absolutely. Is that okay for her? And, or what does that process of like getting in a good space with that, with herself look like? Well, I think that coming to that conclusion will probably take a lot of work of thoughts and emotions and looking at the whole picture, talking with the clinical doctors, therapy, what are all of my options? Kind of like lay out everything on the board. Obviously not right away, but when she feels ready to kind of even see. And she still may decide then, I don't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. But then it's communicating to her husband, who seems very okay with those options still, because nothing has fully been taken away from him of reproducing. Yeah that that's going to be a hard dynamic if she says, I actually don't want to go that route. Maybe we don't have kids. Mm -hmm. Maybe would we just be the best aunt and uncle or to our friend's kids. Mm -hmm. And then it's, what does his life look like if he's not going to become a parent now? And that's what he wanted. So I actually, it, it's funny. So you said husband. They're, they're only dating. Um, oh, I and missed so, that key. Yes. Yeah. And so that's why, like, I... I think in getting ready for this episode, I, I tried to put myself in her shoes um, and something I wanted to bring up just because you, you said husband a couple of times, but it spurred the question in my head. Could this, you know, like on the one side, I could see because I know some compulsive personalities like this. I could see a guy being like, well, I want her to feel secure and this doesn't change anything for me. So maybe like a swooping gesture of my love, like an engagement or something. Or on the flip side, could this spur up feelings for her of like, well, why would he want to be with me then? Because now I'm depriving him of this future and he has no tie to me in a you know more substantial sense, legally binding or whatever. Um, and how can they talk about those together to navigate through? And should he be proposing to her in this moment? I know the answer, but I'm going to ask you anyway. I'm going to say no. <laughs> um, I think that I can understand where his head is at. How do I show her, like, I'm in this with her, mm -hmm. but you don't want to propose in the midst of all these emotions. Yeah. And the female probably doesn't want that either. The girlfriend yeah. is like, like, no. Yeah. Um, And she may turn around and say, I'm going to let you go, right? Like, I'm going to say to you, you don't have to stay with me. Mm -hmm. I'm broken. You don't have to change your life for me. Yeah. And it's... But is that... A f is that fair? Is that fair? Yeah. Absolutely not, right? <laughs> you like her there. I was like, what? <laughs> Absolutely not. And I can see her defense of saying, mm. I don't want him to leave me eventually because of this. So if I mm -hmm. can get ahead of it, right? So we tend to pre-grieve things. Mm -hmm. So she could be in, well, in six months, he's going to think about this. And then he's going to leave me and I'm going to be heartbroken. So how about I jump to the punch and let him go. Let's pile on the grief sandwich now and just get it done with. Yeah. She's at step 17, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. She yeah. The anxiety could bring her to, I just want to get ahead of all this. I couldn't yeah. control this, but I can control if I want to be in a relationship with this person, even if it's not what she wants. Yeah. My best suggestion is not to make any drastic moves completely. On either side. On either side. Yeah. I mean, it didn't seem like he heard the news and he was like, I got to get out of this, right? Yeah. Like, he's very much like, we're just, we're going to figure it out. Yeah. And I think it also depends where they are in their relationship mm -hmm. because if it was something that was moving towards marriage and they were in love, it may be different that they've been dating for four years or a very intense relationship versus I just met you like a month ago. Yeah. You know, and I think that that changes the perspective a lot. Like I'm going into this knowing as I've been with you now for five years, this changes nothing. Yeah. yeah. You are still the person I love. Right. Whether you can have a child or not. Biologic yours. Right. Right. Yeah. And they're already in their mid-30s, so they're also not – Yeah. They're in a, I think when you date in your 30s, it's a different phase than when you're dating in your 20s, at least in New York, right? Because in New York, 
females are like, I want my job, I want my career, I don't need to depend on someone. And so they may have had talks about marriage and stuff like that already mm-hmm. because they are older. Yeah. Um, so I, I do kind of want to, in case, I want to, uh, twofold. How common, because I think that's one of the things that I keep coming back to, like I said, being someone who's approaching 35 and and oddly and eerily relate to like, oh, that would be a bad day in my house. Um, how common is premature menopause? It's, it's not common. It's not common. Okay. It's not common. Well, ladies out there, it's not common. Not common. <laughs> I can breathe a little too. Yeah. Yes, you can breathe. <laughs> I am going to um, go and ask my mom when she started menopause. Yeah, so I don't, immediately after this. My mother to this day will still swear that she has not gone through menopause oh. and she's almost 60. I know. I know. I know. But. She may need to see me. <laughs> Um, so I guess we've, we've, we've talked and, you know, we kind of got onto this and veered off a little bit, but emotionally being supportive, it seems like maybe he should, they should both see therapists or or speak to someone who, in whatever capacity, and then maybe go at couples if, if they need to, um, for that. But I guess, how can he be supportive? Because that's really what this prompt is asking for. Like, what can I do? So, Yes, it might take some unpacking in therapy or talking to a counselor, but are there things he can say? And then from the physical side, are there things he can do to physically support her through symptoms and to emotionally support her through what is the worst Pandora's box present to unpack? I would say not to assume what she needs, Mm -hmm. that to directly ask her what she needs, right? Do you need me to talk to you about it? Do you need me not to mention it? Do you need me to, like, send a text out to your friends and let them know the news that you don't have to do that. And then say, don't mention it unless you bring it up. Mm-hmm. Like, I think he can kind of take some of it off of her plate if she wants. Yeah. I think very directly saying, hey, what do you need from me? Because I think sometimes a lot of people just jump and be like, well, this is definitely what they would want. Yeah. They wanted this in another situation where they were having a hard time. So I think being very direct, I think giving her the weekend is very nice. But like I said earlier... She's going to need more than a weekend. Um, She could be one way emotionally for two months and then wake up in month three and feel totally different. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a roller coaster, right? Like kind of knowing it's going to be very up and down. And also he needs to take care of himself too. Yes, she physically is going through it, but he is also dealing with loss here. So while it is about her, it's not all about her. It's about him too. Yeah. And it's the loss of what she thought was going to happen. So Mm -hmm. he has to then learn her new perspective on things. Absolutely. And they might both be changed people now. And that's what these experiences do to us. They change our perspective on things. They change how we react and how we cope. And I think just being mindful, keeping an eye on her too, right? Because she may be so deep in it that she may not see some of the things that she's doing that are completely out of the norm. And that he needs a support system, too, outside of her at first. Yeah. Okay. And the physicality, because there are hormonal changes, there are changes in libido. There's yeah. changes in mood. There are changes in the vaginal tissue. So that intimacy component may change. Mm-hmm. That's where a lot of the conversation about the physical symptoms, about the emotional wellness, as well as the difficulty potentially with the intimacy can be treated with medications, can be treated with therapy. And not only therapy for mine, there's also physical therapy for the pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. So for that physical, as long as we're kind of doing this together, she should be okay, but he's got to then be patient if something does change for her. Yeah. Okay. Uh, So... What we've been doing the past few episodes is our own, he included one, but our own TLDR, which is, if you're not familiar, too long, didn't read. So if someone's kind of zooming to the end, which they shouldn't, but if they do. um, Premature menopause is rare. Yes. Or at least uncommon. Uh, And if you find yourself in a situation where you or your partner is going through it like this um, gentleman is, just be supportive. Ask what they need. And that's the best way you can... Make sure they're getting what they need from you. Yeah. And even asking, am I doing what you need? Right? Yeah. Like, is this working? Is this helping? Like check-ins. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
Thank you, ladies. Thank you. I think this was a this really was great. <laughs> yeah. When can we come back next? I want more cases. <laughs> Trust me, we'll 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 probably be back with more. And you're top of my list, Dr. McNally. Oh, this is fantastic. And again, this for just women out there, kind of my last plug is if something feels off with your mm-hmm. cycles or you feel off, it may be off. Yeah. Mm. Trust yourself. Trust yourself. And advocate for yourself. Advocate for yourself. I think the last time we chatted, I was bringing that up Mm -hmm. time after time. Yep. If you're not going to fight for you. Who is? Who is? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with that, thank you. Thank Thank you. you, guys.